internet technology. I was asked a couple of years ago by a researcher in Ireland if he needed to test TCP below 10 megabits. Because, of course, you can't buy a service below 10 megabits. And I had to tell him that, well, at my house at the time, I had a service of 2 megabits. And so I could buy a service below 10 megabits. And went on to tell him about experiences in Malawi, where I was on a, uh, oh, great, thank you. It was on a 64 kilobit line that uh, if they ran out of uh, capacity, they simply threw some traffic away. Uh, and in Kabul, where I woke up one morning at four in the morning because the lights came on in my room and that told me that I had electricity, which meant that I could plug into the wall and try to use the satellite link back to Cisco. Uh, in the broadband zone, which crosses North America, includes most of Europe, includes much of Eastern Asia, we have very good internet service. When you step outside that, when you come into South America, when you come into, come into Africa, go to Central Asia, it's a very different story. And one of the questions that we are trying to ask is how do we, how do we make the internet and the benefit that it has been from a business perspective available to all of those other people? Now, who are all of those other people? Well, right now, we've accessed about a quarter of the world's population. We have brought internet service to about a quarter of the world's population. And it's 70% uh, in South America. It's uh, just about 80 or 90% of Central Asia. Uh, as I go into the Middle East, there's an, an amazingly low percentage of people that actually have internet access there. In Africa, it's almost zero. Uh, you know, what, what are the different places that I'm trying to reach? I'm trying to reach uh, a lot of different places. Now, when I look at internet pen penetration in a country, uh, where we're at right now, we have about two billion users of the, the mobile broadband network. We have, uh, I'm sorry, about two, two billion internet users, about six billion mobile cellular users, so, so mobile broadband. And, uh, and about 1.2 billion mobile broadband using data. Okay, so relatively low percentage. That represents, on a national basis in the G20 countries, about 4% of gross domestic product. And we're expecting by 2016, four years from now, that that will double as a percentage and, uh, and, and will, uh, will, will push gross domestic product to about $4.2 trillion. Uh, so about 8% of, of gross domestic product. So for the countries that have very good internet deployment, it's pushing business pushing business very hard and making those countries prosperous. If I look at the effect of increasing internet penetration in a country by about 10%, uh, in, in the, the, the purple ones are your G20 countries, the, the teal ones are the rest of them. And you can see that it has a huge impact. Uh, this is uh, courtesy, the slide itself. It's courtesy Bob Pepper, VP Government Affairs at Cisco. The data comes from uh, OECD, from ITU, from uh, some pretty well researched sources. Now, what he then went and did, I can't tell you which country this is because it was mentioned in a talk, and the president of the country started talking with my CEO and got mad at me. So. I'm not going to tell you what country. I will tell you they speak Spanish then. Um, okay. So what he was looking at was 2007 data, internet penetration and its effect on gross domestic product. And asked the question, what happens if in that country we increase uh, internet penetration by 10%? And the difference was about $11 billion. Uh, as a percentage of that country's gross domestic product, it was, it was pretty big, okay?
This is the kind of impact that we're looking at by increasing internet penetration. Okay, now Arturo mentioned that we ran out of IPv4 addresses a year ago, uh, which is to say that in January of last year, the IANA handed out the last five slash eights, one of them came here. Uh, and a couple of months later, APNIC augured in, and we're expecting Ripe to run out of addresses later on this year, Aaron probably next year, LACNIC not far behind that. What that means is that if you're building your business based on IPv4 address space and you want to increase internet penetration in your country and drive business, you're, you're betting on a resource that we don't have, okay, which is a problem. Now, <clears throat> there's a couple of ways to get around that. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, no problem, we'll just deploy a whole lot of maps and life will be good. Uh, we'll put NAP behind NAP behind NAP behind NAP. But your operators will tell you how the, what the impacts are on your business when you have to, uh, for forensic reasons, identify a customer. If you're uh, deploying stuff behind a NAP, it's very hard. Okay, you, you wind up having to look through logs just to figure out what works the guy is or whatever. Um, and there are a variety of other technologies. I compare that to running with a stack of plates. Okay, if I'm walking around with a stack of plates, I can always add one more plate. Heaven forbid that I trip. Okay, if I trip, I'm in a bad way. And that's really where we're at with IPv4. Yeah, we can add another nap, we can keep things going. But it becomes more difficult and more expensive over time. Now, I've heard a number of people also say, listen, you know, I'll deploy IPv6 in my country when the U.S. deploys it, because the U.S. is sitting on bazillions of addresses and they don't need it. Let's talk a little bit about what's been happening. This is from an OECD report uh, put out in 2009. You can find it on the web, I do. Uh, and it looks at a variety of different countries and their deployment of IPv6 uh, as, as obtained from their, their regional internet registry, uh, starting from 2001. Now, there's a couple of amusing stories here. One of them is that in 2002, Japan got a new premier, and he was making out his speech, and Jin Murai, who was kind of Mr. Internet in Japan, had the uh, authorization to insert two sentences into the premier's speech. And so now you can imagine the premier, he's reading the teleprompter, and what goes by is by 2005, Japan will deploy IPv6 throughout the country. And so he says that, he has no idea what that means. But in 2002, Japan deployed IPv6. Okay? And then in 2006, uh, Uli Jakobsen, who is a, uh, he, he edits the IP Journal, sent a note to John Clemson and Jeff Houston and Tony Hain and myself and said, listen, you guys are always arguing about the economic impacts of IPv6 and when deployment has to happen. Could I get you to have that argument so that I can have it on the record and publish it as an article? So we proceeded to have an argument. Maybe you can find that article on the web. Okay? <clears throat> And, okay, so after it was published, JPNIC, Japan NIC, went to the University of Tokyo and asked a bunch of professors, one of which was very predictable, Hiroshi Asaki, uh, asked them, does it make any sense? The, the things that these guys said in their arguments, do they make any sense? And the economics professors and, and the, the different people that looked at it all said, yes, this absolutely makes sense. One of the things that happened there as a result of J.P. Nick publishing their report was that there was a run on the bank. Basically, throughout the Asian Pacific region, people ran to, can you not hear me? Okay, I don't know what's going on back then. Um, but uh, they, they all went to J.P. Nick and said, 
I want lots of IPv4 addresses so that when everybody else runs out, I'll still have IPv4 addresses. And in the United States, we started actively deploying IPv6. So you can see the line basically does a hockey stick. It goes up and to the right. Okay? If you're waiting for the U.S. to deploy, the U.S. is deploying. The U.S. is deploying. Um, we're also, because APNIC is out of addresses, it's in its last slash eight and in, in its hold down phase, uh, it now is allocating only a very few addresses. I believe it's a slash uh, 20, 22. I believe it's a slash 22 to new companies coming to it. And that's all it's giving out. Okay, so uh, this was discussed on Nanog in uh, December. There's a company in Fiji which uh, has gone and gotten it slash 22. It was very surprised. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And uh, so the question came out to, to Nano. What do you do? Well, you could buy IP addresses at $12 an address. That's one option. Uh, or what, what they're finding that they really need to do is put in an IPv6 service network and put in translation to keep their IPv4 running while they get all of their customers moved to IPv6. It's really the only option they've got. Okay? If they don't do that, they're out of business. Where they're at today, South America will be two years from now. South America will be two years from now. And in your business planning, you need to think about that. Okay, so do we have V4 address space? Yeah, Blacknick has address space. It can hand it out to service providers. Service providers will be able to dole it out to their customers over a period of time. That's true. You'll be able to keep going for a little while. Um, the thing is, that gives you, as I said, additional complexity, which costs you money, makes it harder to deliver a service. And it also runs in parallel with the time that you have really to do an IPv6 deployment. If you think about the issues of deployment, you need to audit your network, you need to make various kinds of plans, you need to train your people. You have a lot of work that you have to do. And for the people that I'm talking with that have done it, they tell me it takes at least a year, if not two years, to do that. And as a result, I'm telling you that two years from now, South America will be in the same boat that Fiji finds itself today. Your clock is ticking. Your clock is ticking. Okay? But IPv6 offers you some real opportunities as well in terms of simplifying your network. If I compare IPv4 to walking with it or running with a stack of plates, I get to set the number of those plates down. I don't really need the additional complexity that I, that I do with IPv4. So it allows me to simplify my network, reduce my operational expense, reduce my capital expense, and, and eventually move out the other side. Okay, now, I gave essentially this talk to our systems engineers, Cisco systems engineers in Japan. And they asked me, okay, when will IPv6 become more important than IPv4? When do you expect that to happen? Give me a date. Well, dates are really hard. It's kind of like trying to decide when price is going to come back. I don't know. But, uh, but I can tell you how to think about it. Uh, any adoption follows an adoption curve. It's a standard economic curve. Where we're at right now, we've got about 12% of the world's uh, uh, autonomous systems advertising IPv6 address space into the backbone and moving services toward their customers. At the point where that reaches 28%, then we've entered the uh, it's taking off kind of a point in, in, in deployment of any technology, and specifically IPv6. And at the point where you get to about 
it actually becomes rational from a business perspective to start saying, why am I still running IPv4? Who are my customers? What services do I need to keep going? What can I turn off in order to free up address space and make my business move forward to really be able to uh, capitalize on that? And the, the key question there is your equipment lifetime. Well, about 43% of Windows machines today still run Windows XP. That is, as of next year, uh, is going to be no longer supported. You'll, you won't be able to get a security update from Microsoft. So Microsoft is pushing its customers very hard in the direction of going to its later releases. At the point where people are on its later releases, they have IPv6 turned on by default. Uh, the companies that make CPU routers, my, mine being one of them, uh, are making the same kind of push right now with IPv6 in the CPE, yeah, the, the router in a person's home. And I would guess, as far as residential access is concerned, the biggest stumbling block between moving things to an IPv6 network and, and where we are right now is the CPE router and the host that, that the application runs on. So, you know, we can expect over the next couple of years for that to actually change uh, pretty dramatically. So we're looking at an equipment life cycle. You basically change your operating system when you trade in your PC. You change your CPE router software when you trade in your CPE. And in both cases, the half-life is about four years. Okay? So we're saying that basically over the next roughly four years, we can expect this to change, okay? And that not because it's somebody's marketing plan, but because that's just how it works. <clears throat> now, I said 12% of all countries, that the <laughs> autonomous systems in all countries are right now advertising the six address space in, in the internet. Uh, if you break it down by region, there's some, some regions that are ahead and some regions that are behind. And it's true that Aaron is the furthest behind. We have more autonomous systems, okay? Our, our backbone operators are all doing it. The uh, autonomous systems that are dragging us back are multi-home uh, companies. But, uh, you know, this is, and by the way, you can look this, this up. It changes every day. I, I looked this up, when was it? The 25th of April. That I, that I captured this graphic. Now what's necessary, um, if you kind of listen to the media, listen to the marketing hype, what you'll hear a whole lot of people talking about is uh, deployment of 6RD, deployment of 4RD or DS Lite, basically trying to game the system in order to get V6 out as a service early running on an existing V4 network. And I know a number of companies that have done that, and that is actually a reasonably good strategy in terms of getting V6 out to a customer. What it depends on, though, at least in the, the 6RD case, is keeping your V4 network running. If the objective, the expectation is that four years from now, you're going to start asking the question, what can I shut down? Um, having your solution depend on the existing V4 network is probably not the best choice, okay? So I'll argue that you really want to literally go through your network over the next year to two years and deploy V6 there, native. And then at some point in the future, four, maybe six years from now, that then you start taking steps toward actually shutting V4 down. And yes, we have similar conversations that going on with uh, enterprise networks and other, other folks. But as I mentioned earlier, the big issue is you want to drive business, you want to make your country prosperous, you want to increase your gross domestic product, you need to increase internet penetration. And to increase internet penetration, you need address space. 
And to, to capitalize on that address space, there are issues related to training, uh, risk and security, uh, and you know, the issues that go through deploying any kind of service. Okay, you need to think of this as a service deployment and something that, that you'll be able to capitalize on. So with that, I'm done. <laughs> You said that, that, that Active 6 okay, may help you to reduce the operation and costs. May you explain? What yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so why do I say it reduces yeah. the operational costs? Well, I should clarify that while you're running two networks, a V4 network and a V6 network, it increases your operational costs. And if you're buying new equipment, you know, if, if your audit of your network says, oh no, I need to change this card, that chassis, pick out a new piece of software. Uh, obviously, there's going to be operational expense in doing that, and capital expense in doing that, of course. But what I'm talking about is the situation where we are right now with um, maps, with various kinds of middleware that are used to support the existing V4 services. The uh, additional cost of an engineer trying to diagnose problems when they happen uh, who was that customer? How did that attack happen? You know, looking through those things and having to, to work through the complexities of the V4 network. At the point where I can step aside from that and do it in a V6 network where I have a common address space and I don't need all that middleware, then diagnosis of problems becomes easier, forensic access becomes easier. I can actually identify, you know, that was the address of sub subscriber number 12 in that city. Uh, I can aggregate my routing better, okay? I mean, there's, there's just a number of things that work better with IPv6. And as a result, you don't need the additional engineer time, and you don't need the additional complex middleware. So it reduces the cost, simplifies things as you're able to move out of the IPv4 space. The statement is really, in the long run, it will save you money. In the long run, it will save you money. In the short term, yes, there's money. Yeah. Of course, there's money. Yes, sir, but... You mentioned that the, in the US, IPv6 is deployed and growing. How is the deployment on uh, broadband SPs for end users? Is there, they're making bad? 